<laughs> For our next panel this morning, we're thrilled to have four experts joining us to discuss the trends of innovation and entrepreneurship in Asia and the role Hong Kong can play. The session will be facilitated by Ms. Sherry Ahn, reporter from Bloomberg Television. Welcome, Sherry. And please welcome the panelists one at a time, starting with Mitch Presnick, chairman of Super 8. Mr. Fritz Demopoulos, founder of Queens Road Capital. Mr. Fred Mwawad, Chairman and CEO of Synergia Group of Companies. And Ms. Grace Xia, Senior Director, Corporate Strategy and Development for Tencent. I'll now hand the floor over to Sherry. Thank you, Nisan. Thank you for emphasizing that that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> I was thinking, if that's the future of Hong Kong and the future of innovation, I was thinking, why do we need this panel, huh? <laughs> but anyway, since we're here, we have a very exciting discussion ahead of you. <laughs> we are here. We should do it. Innovation in Asia. We'll get to discuss uh, the technological advances that are fast altering the playing field. And of course, Hong Kong's unique role when it comes to connecting the world and when it comes to ecosystems it, it, at a time when its own ecosystem is developing so fast, uh, it's one of the fastest growing in the world. Now, you all know our panelists. You have uh, their bio, so I won't get into that. Uh, we have uh, Mitch, uh, Fritz, Fred, and Grace. So let me get started. Um, my first question to the panelists would be, how is Asia positioned compared to other regions in the world when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship? Now, Mitch, where do you see the opportunities in Asia, especially in Hong Kong? Well, I think it's important, uh, first off, to sort of set the table. I believe there are two trends that really govern entrepreneurship in the world today. One is technology, obviously, and the other is globalization. Asia is unique because these two mega trends intersect here more profoundly than anywhere else. Um, you could argue that uh, technology has several centers, but globalization is really being led by countries like China, India, um, and more broadly Asia. So here we can do things in the entrepreneurial space that can't be done anywhere else because we can address the needs of emerging market consumers uh, and solve problems that were previously unsolved instead of just iterating on solutions which were less efficient as you normally see in the developed world. Fritz, now Mitch mentioned globalization, technology intersecting in Asia. Is there anything else that you would add to that? And how do you think Hong Kong is positioned uh, compared to, say, Singapore, which is another hub? Well, I, I think fortunately um, we live in Hong Kong and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. My family lives here. I, I, I think Hong Kong has a number of advantages that, that, that will make it um, one of a number of startup um, centers. Now keep in mind this is not a zero-sum game obviously. So Singapore, um, and you know I have some good friends who live in Singapore, um, I, so I'll, I'll say that first, but I, I, I do think that, you know, I mean, I mean obviously this is an Hong Kong is an advanced economy. The rule of law works. We're generally an open society. We have deep pools of talent in Hong Kong. Um, the financial sector is, is well developed. And we have a lot of ambitious people. And, and this makes Hong Kong, I think, um, a fantastic place um, for startups. In particular, um, 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 Mitch talked about China. We are at the doorstep of China, but at the same time, we are an international hub, we're a regional hub, and that provides a host of opportunities, not only for companies to consider uh, the Chinese as a demand market, but um, other uh, multi-market opportunities in the region. And, and, and to me, that's very exciting. Now, Fred, you're based out of uh, Thailand. Uh, why are you there, and how do you see Asia in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship? Sorry about this. 
So I'm actually based in Thailand for a number of reasons. I, I've been living there for about 25 years. Mostly what got me there is the gems and jewelry business. We've had a factory there since 1988. I traded gemstones for many years. So I built a different, a big portfolio of different companies from the food service business to technology. So what I wanted to do is really build a, a website that's called Task World to encourage companies to better collaborate. So it's a project management software that's cloud-based. And we also added an evidence-based management feedback where you can actually give feedback to different people so they can actually adjust and make improvements to the way they work. So it's very democratic, you just give feedback, and it's evidence-based because you know specifically on what tasks you could do better or where the opportunities are. I think there's a lot of talent in Asia, and I think we've got a lot of advantages. One is cost if you compare it to the US, where you can get very bright engineers for maybe a third up to a fifth of the price. We have a very creative culture uh, throughout Asia, whether it's Hong Kong or Southeast Asia. And what we need to do is expose that young talent and build that talent, give them the opportunity to actually learn and grow, and as a result, nurture the entire ecosystem. And what I see uh, as the biggest challenge is really scaling. We see a lot of companies being seeded. You get funding for great ideas, and these ideas are usually business models that are proven in the US. But where I see an opportunity in Asia in general is how do you scale that opportunity? And that requires more capital, expansion capital. It requires expertise, not only young people with ideas, but it also requires seasoned professionals that can actually put the structure in place. There's a big difference between managing a company with five, 10 people and scaling to 50 or 100. And I've seen that. I've built eight different companies in my own startup. I have 60 people today. The way I manage with 60 is very different than when I had 10 on the team. And I think that's really what we need to do in Asia. Keep on nurturing the entire cycle so we can scale companies, have successful exit, and nurture the entire ecosystem. I want to get into the process of how to do that. Uh, but first, let me go to Grace, because I want to talk a little bit more about the ecosystems out there. Because you lived in Silicon Valley uh, just a year ago. And then now you're working in Shenzhen. You're working in Hong Kong as well. How do you compare those ecosystems? So when I look at. Silicon Valley's ecosystem, I see there are a few key components. First of all, it's a capability to do research and R&D. In Silicon Valley, there are five world-class universities, five national laboratories, and there are a number of really good research facilities in the area. And in fact, there are hundreds of companies in Bay Area. They can trace their origins back to federally funded university-based research programs. That's a huge advantage. Second of all is access to capital. Last year, 40% of US venture capital were made in Silicon Valley. And the third piece um, is the people side of the equation. There are so many serial entrepreneurs in Bay Area that they can mentor and guide the, the young people and new entrepreneurs to how to grow their business, how to start a, a company. I mean, those three components are actually really important to build this whole ecosystem. But don't forget, it takes 60 years for Silicon Valley to build out what they have today. I think when I look at Hong Kong today, Hong Kong have all the key components in place. And to compare Hong Kong with Silicon Valley, Hong Kong can offer a lot more, actually. A very unique value proposition is Hong Kong serve as a gateway to connect East and West. China have been leading the way in many sectors. Chinese companies, when they want to go global, they use Hong Kong as a place for them to refine their business model, refine their product before they are ready to go to the, the rest of the world. And for the Western company, Hong Kong is a safe place for them to get access to China. And for the companies that build in Hong Kong, those entrepreneurs, they think globally from day one, which is a very big advantage. They know how to quickly understand a foreign market, tailor their product, and grow very fast. Mitch, um, Grace just mentioned decades that it took for Silicon Valley to get there. What do you think is the timeline for Hong Kong? And what do you think are the areas that Hong Kong can actually excel in? I think it'll be... Um much more compressed and accelerated here. Everything in Asia tends to happen faster. Um, Hong Kong specifically has a huge 
advantage being one of the most entrepreneurial places in the world. It has an entire history. The entire territory was built on entrepreneurship. People coming here to seek their future. And that hasn't changed. It's very much in the DNA of the place. So when you combine that with the advantages being right on the doorstep of the world's manufacturing center and the ability to then beta products and get products to market, plus one thing that people don't talk nearly enough about in entrepreneurship, it's great to innovate, it's great to invent, but I'm more interested in how do you make practical solutions that can really drive revenue and new industries. And Tencent's a great example, and so is Alibaba, that took some things that may have existed in some forms or parts of it, but they combined them in ways that no one else had done anywhere else in the world. And because of it, they led, they led an innovation which is now being copied by places like Silicon Valley and Europe and so forth. And that's something that people don't talk nearly as much about, I think. The monetizing power of Hong Kong. I think that's where, the, that's where this is at. It's great to innovate, it's great to invent. But I mean, I, I don't know if Elon Musk is in here. I mean, you know, who, I, don't, I, I don't think anyone has more respect for Elon than I do. I followed him since the beginning. But I have to say, he didn't invent the automobile. He took an existing model and he brought it into the, the present. That's really a solution where more entrepreneurs should be looking now. It's not necessarily, I didn't create the economy hotel chain model, but I, I, I did with my colleagues figure out a way to make it relevant in a market like China. And what we did in China is very different from, from an economy hotel chain that you would see in the US or in Europe, but it's very relevant for China. And because we were able to do that, we were able to find new ways to monetize it and make it relevant for commercialization. When we talk about Hong Kong, we also talk about uh, its unique role in getting mainland Chinese companies uh, to give them global exposure as a testing ground uh, to make adjustments there. Uh, Fritz, do you think that Hong Kong still has that role? At a time when so many businesses just get into China just directly. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I buy the gateway model, to be honest. Um, you know, well-run companies around the world, you know, they're just moving to Shanghai or Beijing, or, or, or who knows, maybe Guangzhou or Shenzhen. I mean, uh, gone are the days I think, wow, this is an unknown market opportunity and we have to go through Hong Kong or maybe Taiwan. Um, Hong Kong does have a role still both ways. It, it, it's, it's true. Um, as a supply of intellectual talent, service firms, um, access to capital, I mean, there are, I mean, the, 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 um, more often than not, um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has more IPOs than the NASDAQ does. Um, and that is primarily driven, obviously, by mainland Chinese companies trying to access capital globally. Um, so Hong Kong, as a supply of resources and talent, both ways will continue to be the case. Um, Hong Kong, as a demand market, um, it is pretty small. Um, um, yes, it's an advanced economy. Um, and yes, there are all sorts of interesting um, opportunities here. I think one of the other speakers talked about how um, Hong Kong um, has a high density of well-established global standard businesses. Now, what does that mean for entrepreneurs? Clearly, enterprise-related opportunities, fintech-related opportunities, which is one of the key themes for startup um, Hong Kong, um, um, med tech, health tech opportunities, those can, I believe, emanate from the Hong Kong market above and beyond just a supply of capital and, 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 and professional services. And what's very, very interesting is, um, as we're used to in Hong Kong, as, as, as Mitch said, not only is you know, the DNA of this city entrepreneurship from many, many years ago, and, and the only reason why Li Kai Shing's not on stage is because he probably doesn't have email, to be honest, because I, th I, th I, th I think it's a different generation. Um, or, or Robert Kwok or some of these fantastic entrepreneurs that, that all of us are used to. Um, but not only is it an entrepreneurial center, but everything we do in Hong Kong is, is to be honest, international. And why is that? I mean, I mean every trip um, I take is an international trip, unless I'm going to the new territories, I guess, which isn't very often. Um, and so we are somehow, within our DNA, not only is it entrepreneurial driven, but also international driven. And those companies, that are focused on enterprise, fintech, um, those sets of skills and experiences and Hong Kong as a testing ground may prove to be useful in exploiting those similar opportunities in, in, in other markets, which is fantastic.
Now, if it's consumer, you know, that's a little bit tricky. Mm. Um, you know, very, very competitive local market expertise and local reference points become much more important, uh, which is why, to be honest, so many consumer-driven companies have failed in China that aren't Chinese and, and to be honest, vice versa. Grace, how important is Hong Kong for Tencent? Um, very important. As you know, um, we have our international business office set up in Hong Kong. The reason being is we think Hong Kong is a great place for us to test new ideas, to understand local market. So we have um, a few products actually designed for international market that launched in Hong Kong first. Uh, we have seen great market uh, tractions. And um, this is a great place for us to test idea and hopefully we can bring that to international market one day. Uh, Fred, you were talking about some of the challenges in Asia. Could you elaborate on that, especially when it comes to uh, less developed uh, nations, especially in Southeast Asia? I think the, the biggest challenge we have is how we think about uh, internet companies, how we value them. Hong Kong is known to have succeeded in the property sector, retail sector, financial services. These are all traditional businesses. We understand uh, the cash flows, the operating costs, and the need to really focus on profits. When we think about internet companies and technology companies, the time horizons are dramatically different. And I think a lot of investors don't have that patience, uh, and they don't necessarily give the chance for a company to scale, to acquire enough users. We may focus too much on generate cash, sustain your organization as quickly as possible. That's a very valid mindset when you're actually running traditional businesses, but not when you're trying to actually give an advantage to an internet company. And I think that's really what the US does really well. Uh, in the Bay Area, people look at the long term, they invest lots of money, they build the human resources, the talent, in order to figure things out and give the chance to, for the company to build the brand and go global. And I think that's a challenge that we, we have. It, it starts with funding. It starts with enough people coming up with ideas, building enough talent within organizations so you can truly compete on a worldwide scale. Unless you're geographically focused, if you really want to build a company that competes on a global basis, you'll need all the elements to succeed because it's a very harsh and competitive world. Now, one interesting point in the previous panel on, on success stories in Hong Kong was how there was this gap of knowledge between Asian entrepreneurs understanding the US and the rest of the world and not vice versa. Now, uh, you guys are centered in Asia, in China. Um, how competitive, uh, Fritz, for example, how competitive has it become in China, given that there are more sophisticated domestic entrepreneurs who not only understand the domestic market, but also the rest of the world? You know, I, I, I've lived in China for 14 years and set up five companies. Um, I am, it, it's kind of like a nice whiskey. I, I really love it, but I can't have too much of it anymore. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have to admit. Um, um, and yeah, you know, China's, um, as, as, as you and I talked earlier, um, there's um, asynchronous information, which is unfortunate to the West, because every Chinese entrepreneur knows what's happening in the West. All the computer science textbooks, unfortunately, are, are, are in English. Um, so, and of course, open source and all that sort of stuff is, you know, Chinese engineering talents and entrepreneurs. I mean, they have access to everything. Um, not only that, I mean, China is, I guess, the second largest, third, um, e maybe largest economy in the world. And what a lot of people don't realize is, if we look at the aerospace industry, high-speed rail, nuclear power generation, uh, there are, for example, 22 power plants in the queue to be built in mainland China. I think Westinghouse might have one. Um, and when we think about um, the deep and diversified engineering talent in mainland China, um, those engineers building those nuclear power plants within less than a half a generation are going to know more than anyone will in the United States. Or with high-speed rail, they're going to know more than the Japanese and the Germans just because if, if you build 16,000 kilometers of, of high-speed rail, which is what the Chinese did in the last 10 years, it's really hard to uh, compete with that engineering talent as they go down that learning curve. The same with component manufacturing. We're talking about a number of different verticals with thousands and thousands of talents that have a high level of skill and capability. Now that coupled, which we also talked about earlier, you know, that typical Chinese DNA of being brutally competitive, trying to dominate, trying to make as much money as possible. Um, and then we have second, third time entrepreneurs in mainland China too. Um, I mean, 
many of my friends have set up two, three, four companies, and then we also see on top of that, what Tencent and Alibaba have done. I mean, the amazing corporate entrepreneurship that we've seen come out of Tencent. I mean, WeChat, which bubbled up out of Tencent, which is amazing because it should have been from a private company, but it didn't happen that way. And with Ant Financial from you know the Alibaba organization and all and like the logistics business and now getting into film and buying soccer teams and all that sort of stuff, we're we're, we're just seeing a wide range of, of of entrepreneurship on the on, on the corporate side, on the individual side. And, and what does that mean? Oh, and, and one final note would be the unfair. So, so, we, so we talked about, you know, in, in, in most markets, capital is a little bit rational. Um, un, un, unfortunately, or fortunately in China, um, what, what we have, and, and both Mitch and I have been fortunate recipients of this to, to tap our unfair share of um, financial capital uh, coming into China because the view that it's slightly less risky and that the, and the runway is so long that, 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 that we're entitled to make massive investments and, and fortunately our, our investors have, 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 have given us like the latitude to, to be honest, lose money for, I mean, maybe 10 years to be honest, which is what many of these companies have done. And, and, so, and, and, and so what does that lead to? Extremely competitive environment makes it very difficult. And what I would be worried about if, if, if I was in a Western entrepreneur is there's a, a huge number of entrepreneurs in China that have just been fighting it out. And they're super trained. They're very sharp. And now they're thinking about, oh, yeah, maybe I'm going to go to India or maybe I'm going to go to North America. Um, and it's going to be, I, I would, and, and they have more knowledge and they have capital and expertise, and it, it's going to be very, very difficult for a lot of people, I think. And, and luckily, um, I'm on the right side of history on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, is that your experience? I, well, first of all, well. I, would, I would say you talk about innovative companies. Fritz's company, Chunar, uh, was revolutionary in, in the space that I play in travel in China. Um, with what he did, he took something and he made it extraordinary, and and the market has rewarded him. But but more broadly, I would say, I mean, I guess a lot of people in this room are entrepreneurs or venture capitalists or thinking about the space. We really need to understand that we are one of the nexus points uh, of of globalization, and I'm really tired of hearing about technology and entrepreneurship. Technology is one type of entrepreneurship. Globalization is going to create more value in this world than technology will, especially it will be globalization enabled by technology. So instead of thinking in this of, of us in terms of how to, where are disadvantages and, and competing against Singapore, this is an expanding pie. We are right at the center of it. And we can really do something extraordinary at this time in history and take an advantage of where the world is going and our place in it. We don't need to be looking around at anybody. What we have right here in Hong Kong and the advantages that we can pull together, we've always been great at pulling together resources and talent and innovation ideas and bringing them in really interesting configurations. That's something that we don't need to look at anybody else for. People might want to look at us in Hong Kong uh, for guidance, but we don't really need to be led by anyone in this area. We are one of the global centers of globalization enabled by the technology that's available today. And then one of the key drivers, of course, in China, Tencent, you're into everything, basically. How does the, how do you view um, up and coming startups and uh, how does that play into your broader strategy of uh, innovating and also uh, just uh, driving the ecosystem? Well, first of all, I think uh, we should really watch out a company called Trade with Fun that created by three ambitious young entrepreneurs. <laughs> so Tencent is showing its interest in that company. <laughs> So um, as a big internet company, um, Tencent, we actually tend to disrupt our own product and the markets before anyone else can do. Tencent always have a um, very innovative culture in our company. We also have systems and mechanisms that promote uh, and encourage those product improvement every day. I just want to share a quick fact that at Tencent, we have this um, product development principle called 10, 11, 1000. That means every month, a product manager have to do 10 surveys follow 100 uh, blocks and collect 1,000 piece of feedback. Every month, internally, we have competition uh, for innovation ideas. 
as a result, Tencent is the, the number three companies that hold the most patents in the internet sector after Google and Amazon. So as a company and all, we never stop to improve ourselves and innovate. At the same time, we realize that we are operating in this big China's startup ecosystem. And Tencent's role in this is we work with startup companies, we invest in those companies who can fit into our strategic roadmap. And Tencent, we are an open platform. You know, companies, startups, big and small, they can leverage WeChat platform to access to their users, to grow their ecosystem on our platform. I think it's a very healthy ecosystem between Tencent and all the other companies in China. Now, this panel so far has been very optimistic about uh, the role of Hong Kong, what's happening in Asia. Um, but we have to keep in mind, though, that we are seeing a slowing economy in China, basically a deceleration across the world. Fred, where do you see uh, this deceleration affecting innovation as well as entrepreneurship in the region? I don't think so. I think what we need to do as entrepreneurs is actually focus on solving problems. And that's what innovation is all about. We can use technology to solve problems. Not every idea is going to turn into a billion dollar idea. I know you've got a thousand plus companies that were set up in Hong Kong. There are a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs in this room. Not all of you will succeed, but I think what we need to do is give the chance for as many of you as possible to succeed by solving some problem and doing it in better ways. And I think if we have a thousand companies plus, and if a large percentage of those find their space, and, and it's an advantage when you have a slowdown, because when you have a slowdown, people look at saving money, they look at operating more efficiently, they look at doing things better. So if all the entrepreneurs in this room, and if the government can help them succeed by f finding their space, then I think that's how we build a vibrant ecosystem, and that's how we can make an impact and make our world a better place. And we don't have much time left for the panel, but since there are so many businessmen here, we just want to ask, uh, as entrepreneurs, what are you interested in right now? Uh, Fred, you have uh, 16, uh, you're in 16 regions, you're in different industries. What interests you now? Besides Diamond, my website, uh, <laughs> Taskworld, uh, uh, collaboration. Watches. I believe there's a more efficient way of working. A lot of people actually work using email, attaching documents with information uh, being disparate. Uh, what we do with Taskworld is really find a way to collaborate with your team members and giving feedback so you can enhance execution. So it's doing work that you do all the time, but using technology to do it in far better way and creating more value as a result. Fritz, just quickly, where do we put our money? I, I, I love the revolution in the um, health space and um, anything that has had the government involved for so long is guaranteed to be a mess and I love messy opportunities. <laughs> Mitch? Uh, I'm a player in, uh, in consumer from India all the way to Japan. I think that's uh, especially in the, con in the emerging markets where platforms are helping consumers access products and services that they previously couldn't have access to, but through technology and through payment systems they can. I think that's going to open up billions of new customers. That's going to create multiple billions of new value. Tencent is expanding so fast. A quick word for our entrepreneurs here. A quick thought. Um, well, Tencent's goal is to connect people and bring convenience and service to everybody's life. Um, for entrepreneurs out there, I encourage you to stay foolish and stay hungry and think big. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today and thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much to Sherry and our panelists for such an insightful session. I'm sure you've all gotten a bit of food for thought out of that. Thank you so much, guys. How are we all doing? <laughs>